afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Cheddar, brought to you by HP, Kristen Scholler. And I'm Tim Stenevec. Happy Thursday afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. We're about an hour away from the close of the markets, and so far, we're seeing a mixed bag up there on the big board. The Dow is down more than 40 points on the day today, not even close to session lows, where it was a little earlier in the day, but still in red territory. The S&P 500 is down fractionally right now. The Russell 2000, though, is at record highs. If it were to close in the green today, it would close at a record high. It did close at a record high yesterday. If you take a look at the NASDAQ, the tech-heavy NASDAQ, we are seeing a little bit of red at the NASDAQ as well, just down fractionally, just north of nine points there. That's right. Well, we know Walmart's been a big mover today, Tim, of course, after earnings. We know that trade talks between China and the U.S., of course, these are ongoing, but the market's taking a bit of a dip lower here, of course, after President Trump said he doesn't know if these trade talks will actually be successful. And so we saw the Dow lose some steam on that. But again, still just fractional losses on what has been a muted week, right? We had seen whipsaw moves up and down for these major indices for months since the start of the year. But I would say in the past week and a half, things have really muted out just a bit. Let's also take a look at the Cheddar 50 Index, put together with the help of our friends over at TradeStation. This index is up three-tenths of a percentage point. And you can see all of those movers within the Cheddar 50 scrolling across the bottom of the screen. So gainers do include Macy's, GoPro Macy's up for a second day after we got those earnings yesterday. And there are some laggards, CBS down, of course, on news about this lawsuit, which Tim and I will uh, touch on here shortly, as well as Pandora and Square trading lower. Let's talk, yeah, let's talk about a few of these different Cheddar 50 stocks that are moving the Cheddar 50 index right now. Blue Apron is actually up 6.6%, but as Kristen and I talk about all of the time, it doesn't take much to get this stock moving. That's because it's trading so low, down more than 80% from its IPO price, or I should say down roughly 80% from its IPO price. GoPro up more than 2% on the day. Macy's up 2%. CBS, though, is down 4.14%. We're going to tell you why that is in just a minute. Pandora down 2.7%. 6%. We have a lot on tap today. Let's check out what we have. A congressman filing a formal grievance against a lawyer who's caught on video threatening to call ICE on workers speaking Spanish at a New York City restaurant. We're going to talk to him in just a minute. And Quip, you probably have seen the ads for that. It's that electric toothbrush company. Raises $10 million in funding. The CEO of the startup is going to be here. I'm guessing he's going to bring some toothbrushes. Plus, a look at that digital series that lets viewers choose what side of the story they want to watch. We're going to explain how with the creator of Distance. All that and more coming up. A big hour. show, definitely. And remember, if you have any questions for our guests, for us, you can tweet them to us using the hashtag Cheddar Live. Leave a comment in the Facebook comment section or even make a comment to the combo on Twitch. Well, let's Paul, talk about some of the big headlines that we are following this hour. The Vatican is calling for more regulation of markets and financial systems. It says that economic crises show that markets are not able to govern themselves and need morality and ethics. The Vatican added that profit that is not for the greater good was, quote, reckless and amoral culture of waste. It comes at a time when some, including the Trump administration, want to loosen the banking rules that were put in place after the 2008 economic crisis. Now, this pronouncement and could actually affect the attitude of the church's one billion members. Wow, so we didn't see the markets really move on this at all, but the Vatican, we know, has been weighing in on more of these social issues of late and trying to make some of these large institutions that have never necessarily been socially conscious institutions or, or sectors, that is, trying to infuse some of that into, of course, at least in this case, the financial markets. And uh, Tim, I know that we've seen, too, that the Vatican has tried to talk about sort of what we call in finance ESG, but in its own way in other ways as well. Yeah, it's so interesting to see this. And is there, this actually, this statement is actually posted on the Vatican website. It's, it's very long. And it got, when you and I were talking about this before the show, Chris, and it really got me thinking about earlier this year, we did see uh, large, large organizations uh, start calling on businesses to be more uh, environmental, to have more of a social mission, to have more of a social purpose, mm -hmm. and arguing that because consumers have changed the way they're looking at these companies, if these companies don't come out with a social mission and aren't actually doing well, but also doing, they're not just doing well, they're doing good, that's what they need to be doing, uh, then consumers will move away from them and investors will move away from them as well. I so far haven't quite seen that happen. We did see a little bit of that with the gun debate uh, right. after the Parkland school shooting, of course. 
when, uh, but. We hear that investors increasingly care about these ESG scores, environmental, social, and corporate governance as well, but it hasn't, to your point, we haven't seen necessarily one massive case where investors have at least openly fleed a particular stock or or fled you know, an entire grouping of stocks. The gun debate certainly was, was one example there, but we know that in some of these, these major portfolios, those companies are still part of them, part of the holdings. All right, well, in some other news, a judge has ruled against CBS that sending the shares lower today, which we told you about here just minutes ago. The judge denying a motion for a restraining order against Sherry Redstone's National Amusements. That's a holding company for CBS and Viacom. And that decision giving a victory to Redstone. So in a battle between the broadcaster and its controlling shareholders, CBS argued it was necessary to prevent Redstone from interfering with the board vote to limit her voting power. Redstone says she isn't attempting to force anything. The chancellor said CBS has a good case, but he was not convinced the harm CBS fears is irre uh, irreparable. So CBS has been pushing back over a potential merger with Viacom. And basically the ruling here is that the judge saying that CBS does have more components in its arsenal to fight if Sherry Redstone does try to essentially hostily merge both of these companies. And look, uh, look, <laughs> we've seen so much M&A activity over the last year in this space. Just a year ago, or less than a year ago, it was that and it was announced that Discovery would buy scripts. That has been approved. We've also seen that Disney is, intends to purchase parts of 21st Century Fox. There are several reasons why these companies are tying up. But the gist of it is because of the way, the changing way that consumers are getting their TV. They're not subscribing to cable the same way that you, they used to. Everybody is cutting the cord. I shouldn't say everybody. I don't want to oversell it. But when you are a big media company that is used to making money a certain way, and suddenly you do see a sea change in the way that people are consuming content, the way that advertisers are choosing to, to where advertisers are choosing to put their money, uh, that's, what, that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing these companies want to band together to get bigger so they can then do more for these advertisers who are now have a choice of going to Facebook or Google for more targeted ads. They also want to make sure that they're extracting as much money as they can from these ca cable, in these ca in the form of carriage fees from the Comcast of the world. And that's that's what right. They're trying to bend up. And we've seen we were showing a stock chart there just about you know how much CBS has gained. It not necessarily isn't seen massive gains over the past year or so, but right, it's been a tale of two stocks. CBS has gained here as Viacom has really suffered over the past several years or so. And then so the question is, you know, do these companies merge together? In this day and age, we've heard not only is streaming taking over an internet TV and, and less money going toward TV budgets, right, but that because there are so many behemoths in the market and we've seen a lot of consolidation and a lot of these tech companies also now take on the role and responsibility of media companies as well, whether or not they explicitly say that. It has been, some say, a winning case to go at it together, right, to merge some of these companies, even though CBS and Viacom, fairly large in and of themselves, some probably Sherry Redstone's thought process that this will certainly help bringing them together, even if they down the road want to sell to a, an Apple or a Facebook someday. All right, and another story here. YouTube is launching a new music streaming service. So it will be available May 22nd and comes with features like personalized playlists based on your history. The free version will have ads or you can pay $10 a month for ad-free streaming, similar to what we see with Spotify and the likes. YouTube is also rebranding YouTube Red as YouTube Premium now. So that's going to cost you 12 bucks a month, and it will include the normal YouTube Red service, so basically series, um, more video components, as well as now YouTube Music comes at a time, too, Tim, where we know Spotify, which has really for years now had a stronghold on the music streaming market is also now trying to dip into video as well. I have lost track of how many times YouTube and Google have rebranded or come out with new services that are essentially uh, provide the same product, which is access to about 30 million songs that you pay $9.99 a month for. It is a Google Music All Access, Google Music Streaming, YouTube Red, YouTube Premium. Uh, hopefully this one for Google is here to stay. One thing that I do find interesting about this relaunches the focus uh, for YouTube Premium on the on Discovery. And look, everybody's focusing on Discovery because it's the only way you can differentiate yourself when everyone has the same catalog, when Tidal has the same catalog as Apple Music, which has the same catalog as Spotify. But Google un is uniquely positioned given the data troves that they have about you, and they're actually using your location and where you are, what types of buildings you're in to actually serve you different types of music, which I think is compelling, and maybe 2018's consumers are ready for that. Right, well, also, too, at a time where we know with so many options among consumers, right, it feels like just a checkbox, to be quite honest, that YouTube had to fill. Whether or not they're going to be able to rake in more money is still, you know, to be determined. 
but a lot of these companies are packaging all of these components together now and selling them to consumers, so Google have to, having to get on board as well. All right, coming up, a New York congressman reacts to the racist rant going viral. You see it right there on the screen. We're going to have more on that after the break. Welcome back to Cheddar, brought to you by HP. Well, yesterday, a rant by a New York lawyer, Aaron Schlossberg, went viral. The 42-year-old yelling at employees of a restaurant for speaking Spanish. Let's take a look. Your yes. staff yeah. is speaking Spanish to customers when they no, should be speaking. Being very violent. I mean, sometimes very violent. they do. Very yeah. 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 Very Every person I listen to, he's spoken, he's spoken, she's speaking it. He's America. They, they, yeah. <laughs> All right, joining us now is Congressman Adriano Espaillat. Congressman, good to have you with us here. You are the first formerly undocumented Im immigrant to ever serve in Congress, and you are formally now filing a complaint against the man in the video that we just showed. What was your immediate reaction when watching this? Well, I think just like many people across the state of New York and the country, we were alarmed to see this kind of behavior. Uh, display openly in public, and I think it has a lot to do with the intolerance uh, air that has been uh, sent out there by the White House. Uh, White House that calls it calls immigrants animals, that calls that tries to split children from their families. Uh, it, it's an air of intolerance that's gripping the nation, and I think people like this attorney feel that they can they're above the law and they can do these things and get away with it. So that's why I filed a formal complaint this this morning. You filed a former complaint along with the Bronx Borough President Ruben Diaz Jr. What, what is the outcome, Representative Espaillat, that you hope to achieve by filing this complaint? Well, I want uh, the uh, Grievance Committee to really take a look at this, particularly because there's further evidence that has emerged that shows that this is not the first time that this uh, person engages in this type of behavior. And so that uh, I'm very concerned that an officer of the court, an attorney, may not be adhering to the code of ethics that they have to abide by. So I want the full process to go forward, and whatever the disciplinary committee decides, uh, we will welcome. But it could be anywhere from pro uh, probation to a suspension. Uh, I think this is uh, egregious action that should be punished if found to be uh, reliable and 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 so, uh, evidence uh, could corroborate what he did. Obviously, uh, 
you know, we've seen uh, other instances of this type of behavior by him in social media. There may be other stuff coming up on, on surfacing later, but right now we feel that he has engaged in this type of behavior repeatedly, and he should be sanctioned by, by this grievance committee. The New York Times reporting that he uh, has been ad was admitted to the bar more than 10 years ago. Uh, Representative Espaillat, do you think he should be disbarred? That's not for me to say. That's for the grievance committee to say. Uh, certainly, this is a serious action that he took. Uh, it is uh, xenophobic. It is racist in its uh, scope. And uh, we don't even know if he has uh, engaged in this uh, type of action dozens of times and just has not been recorded. So we are concerned, and this is certainly, uh, we don't know to, to what degree he may have re misrepresented some of his clients because maybe they were Spanish speaking or even uh, Chinese speaking clients. And so we don't know the full extent of the impact that his behavior has had in an average uh, resident or citizen of the state of New York. We want the committee to really take a good look at this. Congressman, according to the Center for Responsive Politics, Schlossberg, the man that we showed in the video there, did donate $500 to President Trump's campaign. And of course, this video comes after we heard President Trump called some immigrants animals. That happened yesterday. The rhetoric that we're getting from President Trump, does that concern you about the knock-on effect that it's having to his supporters across the country? Well, it's very toxic rhetoric that's poisoning the atmosphere. And, and one cannot predict the kind of harm that this rhetoric could have across the population. It could be something like this, uh, perhaps uh, someone uh, just uh, ranting racist or xenophobic uh, comments. It could be something like what happened in Charlottesville, uh, running down and killing somebody. It could be uh, a shooting. No one really knows uh, what happens when, when uh, fear and when, and when hate is spewed out there to the general population. And this is coming from the highest law on the land, the White House. So if, if people feel if the president is above the law and he can get away with this, well, may, perhaps I could do the same. Has your office seen an uptick in, in incidents like this, Representative, Congressman? We have seen and we have heard of many cases. Perhaps is because social me media is more prevalent right now and, and available. but. Certainly, there seems to be a heightened sense of awareness, uh, both, I guess, from uh, the identifying perpetrators as well as from the victim side. I think that people are more aware of this kind of hostile uh, environment that was highlighted with, with, by people with torches mar marching in Charlottesville, reminiscent of like those black and white films from the Third Reich. This is unacceptable for America. This kind of behavior should not be accepted. And certainly, whether uh, an, uh, an isolated or perhaps uh, a, a, an event of such a sub egregious nature as the one perpetrated by this uh, lawyer uh, or, or other organized events that are motivated by hate or fear uh, will cause damage on the general population. We're very concerned about this. And America must come together, and the way to come together is to hold these folks accountable. Uh, Congressman, we know that lawmakers are really looking at tech companies very closely now, whether it be Twitter, Facebook, Apple, Google, you name it, and some of the abusive practices, among other things, and the data privacy that goes on with these different tech companies. Interestingly enough, we know that this man that we showed in the video, Aaron Schlossberg, was quickly identified on Twitter. And so when you look at these tech companies right now in Congress, in your office as well, do you see that, that there are good things that can come out of, out of these tech companies? I mean. Immediate, almost immediate identification would seem like a plus in terms of holding people accountable, which you mentioned. Well, there, there, there is no question that the technological revolution has yielded uh, positive results in science and in media everywhere. Uh, but it has also its great challenges. And so we must really take a look at it. This is a perhaps, it's not like the industrial revolution that would, it was sweaty and noisy and steamy. This is a very quiet, but yet one of the most impressive revolutions in the history of, our, of, of, of the world. And we must now take a look at it uh, and begin to draw some kind of regulation, some, kind of, some type of guidelines that will govern the behavior of technology in a responsible way while also uh, supporting and respecting the freedom of information and, and expression. Congressman Adriano Espaillat, thank you again for joining us. We appreciate it. Thanks, Congressman. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Coming up, Silicon Valley is on a bit of an apology tour. We're gonna break that down right after this. Keep it here, we're watching Cheddar. Welcome back to Cheddar, brought to you by HP. Uber has released a new national commercial, but it isn't to sell more people on its service or explain a new offering. Instead, this ad is here to say sorry. And Uber isn't the only Silicon Valley on an a Silicon Valley company, excuse me, on an apology tour. Joining us now is John Schwartz, senior reporter at Barron's. John, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, look, this ad is all over national TV. It's all over the internet right now. Let's take a quick listen. One of our core values as a company is to always do the right thing. And if there are times when we fall short, we commit to being open, taking responsibility for the problem, and fixing it. And you've got my word that we're charting an even better road for Uber and for those that rely on us every day. In the ad, you see CEO Dara Khosrowshahi, who's been on the job for just a few months, and you can hear his voice throughout the ad. John, is this ad effective? Does it get Uber's message across? And what is that message? You know, actually, I do think it's effective. I actually think of it as kind of a State of the Union address from Dara. He's been on the job now as a new CEO for several months. He inherited a company that had a lot of flaws, um, not in, just in terms of the business model, but in terms of the culture. So what he's trying to do is reset where the company is and reach out to not just the customers, but the entire community in Silicon Valley and let them know, yeah, we made mistakes, we, we can be better, and we are gonna move forward, which is actually the tagline for the commercial. John, very interesting here, of course. We've seen Dara Khosrowshahi tweeting ever since he took over at Uber, a tweet a week or so, every other week or so, but this is sort of yeah. the first very public comment uh, that we've got from Dara Khosrowshahi, of course, you got to assume there's a marketing department behind this, but him saying, look, I am in control now, and this is absolutely going to be different leadership than it was in the past. It already just, is. I mean, in yep. a sense, it already is because he's open. I mean, with Travis Kalanick, the previous CEO of Uber, it was a very secretive, almost paranoid culture. Some people compared it to the Nixon administration. They went that far. And I think what Dara is doing is really, really good. In fact, what he's doing is he's kind of starting his administration, so to speak, on a positive angle versus, say, Facebook, which is kind of reacting when you think about apologetic TV ads. They're, in a sense, kind of reacting to the data privacy issues that, that are surrounding them. So Uber's, again, taking this 
story and kind of put, putting its spin or narrative early on in the story versus waiting until something something bad happens again. It's so interesting though, because I, I do think that a lot of bad stuff happened at Uber before Khosrow Shahi, of course, took over. I mean, that's why he's CEO. Kalanick sure. really s s stepped right. in it's a lot it. while he was like there. The it's part of the, yeah, it's part of the cleanup. I mean, it's part of the cleanup effort. And again, you're resetting the company and its expectations because again, in Silicon Valley, the companies are reflected by their CEOs. That's the personality of the company, uh, whether good or bad or indifferent. And I think one of, the th one of the things that not just tech companies, but companies like Wells Fargo are doing is they're trying to reestablish their brands. And they realize the best way to do that is to go directly through television ads, especially during big events. So like for instance, the Uber events, the Uber ad showed up during the NBA finals during a huge audience and that's kind of a younger, more millennial audience that probably appeals to the type of people who might use Uber. Judd, of course, Facebook also launching a similar type of ad recently titled Here Together, different than the Uber ad, which makes sense. I mean, right, we all know Mark Zuckerberg. Mark Zuckerberg has been very much in the public of late and trying to connect that company with its 2 billion users that it has on the platform, different right. from Uber, which we know needs a, needs a, essentially a formal introduction from Dara Khosrow Shahi. But the different approaches that these companies have taken, you think the right one for Face Facebook? Facebook's yeah, Facebook is more reactive. I mean, they had to do it. In a sense, there's a parallel between the two companies. Zuckerberg did, doesn't give a lot of interviews, but you notice he went on his apology tour. He did a, a, a blitzkrieg of, of interviews and mea culpas and apologies, and he spoke before Congress. He's going to speak before European Parliament. So that was kind of a, a deviation from what they normally do, which is similar to, to, to Uber. The dif difference between the two is that Uber is trying to take this first wave of the new administration and set a precedent while Facebook is kind of retrenching and trying to correct what has been a problem and will, what will continue to probably be a problem when we hear about other breaches that or other data uh, breaches or problems that may occur there. And I think there might, John, there might be in more in the future, actually. If you're Zimmer, if you're running Lyft right now and, and you're seeing the way that Uber is sort of trying to become the kinder, gentler version of itself, which for many years was seen as, as Lyft, what are you thinking? Well, I'm thinking that, this, that they're, what they're doing is they're reaching out to the major urban areas where Lyft has been gaining market share slowly and eroding away and chipping away at Uber's, at Uber's strength. So in a sense, uh, I would be worried, but if I were Lyft, I would continue to do things I'm doing as they have, as they have. they're expanding quickly and they already have the brands that does, that's not sullied by past scandals. Do you think the apology tour is what, what was, what's been needed right now, John, from the tech community? It is, I mean, I think there's this general sense that tech is not well liked throughout the rest of the country. There's this like, certain arrogance and hubris that seeps through. Um, you even have companies, tech companies, calling out one another. For instance, Tim Cook has made no secret of his dislike of the way Facebook does business and the way they monetize data. In a sense, he is kind of using that to a competitive advantage for Apple as well as a recruiting advantage by pointing out within tech, there are good guys and bad guys, and we're not all bad. All right, John Swartz, senior reporter at Barron's. Thanks so much for joining us this afternoon on Cheddar. Thanks for having me. All right, well, coming up, how toothbrush startup Quip is taking on the dental space.
to you by HP. Well, for this week's Keep Reinventing segment brought to you by HP, we are taking a look at oral health company Quip. The startup announced Wednesday it raised $10 million in funding and did acquire Afora, which is a dental care membership service. Joining us now to talk more about this is Simon Endeavor. He's the founder and CEO of Quip. Simon, great to have you with us. Thanks for joining us. No worries. All right, so Afora is going to become the first to join your newly launched Quip Labs. How is this going to help position you within the dental space? Well, I think that you know uh, the dental space traditionally is it's made up of these three different buckets: uh, the professional products that you use each day, the the way that you use them, and then going and visiting professionals every six every six months or as often as you should be using, uh, visiting them. And I think that traditionally those buckets have been very separate. Brands live in one or the other or the other and kind of rarely talk together. And we realized from the beginning that joining those things together uh, was going to be a really it's going to be the only way that we could really kind of solve the oral health problem. And so bringing Afora in really helps us get to that third bucket, that kind of services bucket, improve the service there, and ultimately join the three together and really be one of the first to, to do that. And I think that's something that, you know, being a startup, being kind of a small team, nimble and fast moving, we're able to do, which maybe the larger companies, you know, takes a, takes a while to, to kind of get to. Well, for those who aren't familiar with Quip and maybe don't yeah. live in New York City and seen the ads yeah. on the subway, which yeah. I, I feel like are everywhere, yeah. explain how the service works and, and how much it costs. So uh, uh, Quip starts at about $25 for a starter set. You can optionally get toothpaste with that, with that electric toothbrush. Uh, every three months, we send you a brush head uh, or, and for $5. For $10, you also get uh, toothpaste in that set. And every, every three months, we send you that, that subscription, that refill. I uh, remind, remind you to go to the dentist every six months or so. Uh, and you know, oral care is all about routine. It's about the two-minute brushing, uh, brushing twice a day, changing your brush head on time, and visiting the dentist on time. And you get those really core basics right, and you'll prevent the really big problems that will cost you a lot of pain and uh, dental visits that you don't want to be, you know, don't really experience. Now, the $10 million that you just raised, how yeah. is that going to help grow the company? So we actually raised a Series A not too long ago. I think it closed back in November or October last year. Uh, and we've seen a lot of growth since then. I think this, this uh, debt financing round just keeps the, keeps the pedal down. I think we saw a lot of growth. We wanted to keep that going. And also these other projects like Quip Labs. So we, we, we're, in, we're privileged really to meet uh, some amazing people and, and products and brands and services that are doing great things in the dental space, but often aren't able to get traction because you know, they're usually missing the, co the connection to the patient or the consumer. Um, and that's something that we think we've done very well. So we wanted to create this space and this uh, concept to bring some of those in, such as Afora, and, and kind of help each other out and, and, you know, and go from there. So you know, part of the funding will certainly help us to really accelerate some of those, those extensions to what we're currently doing. Um, how would you say you're reinventing dental care? I think it's you know, how we're bringing the three, the three pieces together, really. I think from, from the very beginning, uh, I, you know, I mentioned the pillars. I, I mentioned how important it is to, to really bring those three things together. From the very beginning, we realized that the biggest problem above all of that, there was great services, great products, uh, great advice out there if you wanted to go find it. But one of the biggest problems is that people just honestly don't love brushing their teeth and they hate going to the dentist. So for us, above all, it was all about uh, uh, it was all about creating a brand that people actually enjoyed to use, a, a, a toothbrush they wanted to pick up twice a day. And from there, we could serve them with the full oral care routine. We don't have much time left, Simon. No when I think of your company, I think of Dollar Shave Club. It's this yeah. company that built up a huge subscription service by yeah. essentially doing something for less money that a yeah. traditional you know, traditional company like Gillette couldn't do. Yeah. It was bought by Unilever for a billion dollars a few years ago. What's yeah. your end game here? <laughs> uh, great question. Uh, our end game, I think, is really to, first end game or our first goal is to really fill out the service. Honestly, the Sephora acquisition really gets to that point. And I think we just want to prove that you can bring those three pillars and be uh, you know, one service for the whole of oral health care. So we're focused on getting to that first and then, and then we can see where it goes from there. All right, Simon and Never, I want to just give my teeth like a little brushing here right <laughs> yeah. now. Founder and CEO of Quip, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Thanks, Simon. Now a look at some top national headlines. We are following this hour with Cheddar Big News anchor Vanessa Freeman. Vanessa, good afternoon. Good afternoon, guys. Well, of course, this story we've been following pretty much all this week. Right now, a new eruption from that Kilauea volcano causing more trouble on Hawaii's Big Island. The latest eruption shot ash and smoke 12,000 feet into the air Thursday. Nearby residents are being asked to shelter in place. Now, this is just the latest as the volcano has been causing damage and evacuation since it first went off on May 3rd. Meanwhile, the officer who resigned in disgrace after the Parkland school shooting is keeping his pension. 
Scott Peterson will receive more than $8,000 a month as part of the union contract with the state. Peterson was a resource officer at Marjory Stoneman Douglas High School during that mass shooting back in February. Well, he was criticized for never going into the school to confront the gunman. 17 students were shot and killed. Peterson was suspended and allowed to retire instead of being fired, which is why he was able to keep that pension. Meanwhile, a stunning revelation about the late Whitney Houston. Close friends and family revealed Houston was a victim of sexual abuse. This all coming out in, new, in a new documentary on Houston's life before she became famous. Whitney's longtime assistant, Mary Jones, confirmed to the director that cousin, Dee Dee Warwick, abused Houston. Now, Dee Dee is the sister of Dion Warwick. No charges were ever filed in that uh, Whitney Houston documentary is due out later this summer. Whitney Houston passed away in 2012. Kristen and Tim, back to you. All right, Vanessa, thanks so much. It's Vanessa Freeman, live at our CBN studios in the Flatiron Building in Manhattan. Coming up, we're going to dive into the performance of Movie Pass majority owner Helios and Matheson right after this. We're watching Cheddar. Well, now it's time for our series, Generation Traders, sponsored by E-Trade, the original place to invest online. We are going to highlight the most compelling business stories that are moving the market while utilizing E-Trade's innovative trading platform. And though the tools are E-Trade's, the opinions and statements are ours. Last year, the company launched an offer that appeared too good to be true, and it turns out it might have been. For $10 a month, MoviePass subscribers were promised nearly unlimited access to movie theater tickets. and. That helped grow its user base to 2.7 million active members, but it raised questions as to how the company could generate a profit and whether the business model is sustainable. That's right. And in an interview last month, Helios Matheson CEO Ted Farnsworth defended the strategy. We see it where you're going to be seeing more and more theaters that we're signing up as we go along where they share revenues with us because we double consumption. So the average American goes to four movies a year and we just want them to go to eight movies a year. So when they go to eight movies a year and they double the consumption, they're also doubling their consumption of concessions, which the theaters make 80, 85% on. So overall, for the, whole, for the whole ecosystem of the theater business, it's an amazing thing. 
The company, though, has struggled anyway. It faced massive backlash after indefinitely suspending its movie a day plan and was forced to bring it back. And recent reports say it's burning it through cash. So we're going to pull up a one year chart of Helios and Matheson to take a look at the performance. Here you can see the remarkable spike in shares last fall when the $10 plan was introduced and the subsequent drop. From all time highs back in October, shares are down 98%, and they're actually trading below where they were before the plan launched. That's right. The company has made several changes to its subscription service recently in an attempt to bring in more customers. For example, charging different rates for family plans based on where customers live. So those who do live in New York or Los Angeles may pay more than those in rural areas. Let's focus in on Helios and Matheson stock over the last six months. Pull that up on the chart here. Here you can see shares have been under pressure even after that October spike and fall. Last month, an auditor raised concern over the company's ability to sustain its business with losses from MoviePass driving Helios to a $150 million loss last year. That's right. So let's take a, a one-month view of Helios and Matheson. We'll pull up the chart here. And given the big fluctuations, it is hard to tell, but shares actually rose 4% on Wednesday after the company did post a surprise profit for the first quarter. So still, though, revenues did come in less than expected. And despite all the changes to its service, MoviePass did add more than a million subscribers in the quarter. Farnsworth, Helios, the CEO, who we just showed you there, says he expects to reach 5 million subscribers by 2019. 5 million by the end of 2019. Well, as always, there are several factors to consider when looking to trade or invest in a stock. It will be important to follow this company's cash flow and whether it can reach its goal of doubling its user base in the next year and a half. Generation Traders, now it's your turn. Visit E-Trade's innovative platform to get started. All right, well, coming up, the company that is using blockchain for private equity. Plus, we'll watch as the markets close here for the day. Welcome back to Cheddar, brought to you by HP. Well, at the Consensus Conference on Monday, Brad Smith sat down with the CEO of Swarm Fund, a company that is considered the blockchain for private equity. Let's take a look. Hey, what's going on, guys? I'm here with Philip Piper, CEO of the Swarm Fund. Philip, we got to know, you know, Swarm is considered the blockchain for private equity. What opportunity did you see within the private equity space bringing some of your background 
and marrying that with blockchain and some of the interests that are really manifesting themselves right now. I think it's fair to just describe, first of all, how we came about to do this. And yeah. We came actually from trading cryptocurrencies ourselves. And one of the problems is there's a high degree of volatility. You know, everything goes up and down in the same fashion, and it's really hard to escape that volatility. There's some functions, but even those are not solid. So we, we were urging to get something that had a backing of balance sheets and cash flows to, to trade on that ourselves. Mm -hmm. Uh, through that process, I discovered a project that had a first iteration in 2014, and then we revived that project because the time was ready to actually bring out security tokens, to actually you know, tokenize things that have a real manifestation in the real world. And we are starting to tokenize with um, you know, LP positions and funds. So something that is solid, that is proven, that is managed professionally, and you know, by tokenizing it, it, has, it gains a lot of uh, benefits. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about the, the volatility and kind of mitigating some of the risk there, how exactly does Swarm work? So we are a, a community owned and community governed uh, infrastructure and we are a nonprofit organization. So we are just a service organization to the community building software tools that the community can deploy to tokenize these assets. So in, in short, it works that the, the assets themselves have an existing capital structure, we build a legal counterparty to actually own part of that, um, and then that legal counterparty gets tokenized in a regulatory compliant way. So with all the restrictions that need to be put in place, you need to have transfer restrictions in place so that the token cannot be traded to people that shouldn't own it. Uh, you need to be compliant from a reporting structure. You need to have a qualification of investors going into that. We built that entire infrastructure or the network to drive that without actually fulfilling the function in the long term ourselves. And, and so what are some of the big regulatory hurdles that we still need to surpass at this point, given that that is a large part of the conversation right now across the industry? Uh, this is going to be an interview in itself. Uh, <laughs> so it's, uh, it's obviously there's a lot of uh, figuring out that the regulators are doing themselves by you know, trying to figure out like, how big this will become, who's engaging, what is the necessity for investors of different qualities to engage, and what are the securities they have to put in place to make the investors not you know, have some negative experiences or even fraudulent experiences. So you know, just the, the space itself has a lot to figure it out, and a lot has to do with the definition of what a security is. For us specifically, uh, we, we are unta we're tapping into a new world that actually allows a tradability of a private asset to, tra to, to, to be way different than it has been in the past. So that will abide by the same rules that exist already, but it will actually be much more fluid. So regulators will have to step in, observe what's happening. There will be new reporting requirements being created. Um, and then there's a new realm of actors that suddenly are entering the space and you know, uh, us being one of them. That, that so far are not known entities to regulators. So there's a huge degree of conversation um, that has to evolve. And we don't know quite, quite concretely how that's going to function, but there's a lot of countries out there that are shaping their legislation to meet this demand, so. And you yourself previously held positions at some of these historical financial institutions that are just now dabbling a little yeah. bit themselves. Uh, Deutsche Bank being one of them as well, coming from the private equity and management positions that you've held. Yeah. How would you grade the overall financial services ability, the financial uh, player's ability to really embrace blockchain technology thus far? Oh, I, I love that question because it actually sort of, we have under, undergone years and years of FinTech already. So there's actually a huge degree of forward-looking organizations that are already very, very um, adventurous, to say the least, in, in exploiting market opportunities. So there, there's an outer rim of the traditional, very conservative financial industry that is engaging already. And we see this already happening, whereas I think in the first quarter there was 80 crypto hedge funds being formed at, the, um, at Wall Street. And I think there's, um, the necessity is, is, is coming in because customers are asking. And these traditional financial institutions have to adopt and, and serve that need. So I think like in other realms and industries, the same customer need is going to drive a lot of the agenda. And sometimes some people can, and some people can change that fast enough. So we'll see what happens. Absolutely, and lastly, we got to know, what industry do you think is most ripe for disruption via blockchain? Well, I, I think one of the perfect use cases has already demonstrated to be working. I mean, uh, the, the remittance payment space is, is a driving force behind the cryptocurrency in general. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it didn't make sense to send money from a, from a Filipino worker back to the family in Philippines uh, and losing a lot of percentages along the way. 
but actually do it in a way that actually you've, you've got more direct uh, benefits. And then there's a word of mouth component to that too, because suddenly 10 family members in that country actually learn about blockchain, learn to use it, et cetera. So um, I think that's going to prolong in that realm. Things that are more on the, on the innovative side, the traditional banking system is going to stick around for a while. It's yeah. not going to go away anytime soon. But it really depends on how the customer evolves in the need to be serviced in a new fashion. Mm -hmm. And we've seen this with uh, millennials also in the robo-advising space, right, yeah. uh, with Wealthfront and Betterment and others. You know, not that these are blockchain companies, but you're seeing that technology is driving force behind this uh, product innovation. Right, absolutely. Uh, Philip Piper, such a pleasure to be here with you and to have you join us for a little bit and appreciate Thanks your for insights. Having me. Yeah, absolutely. It's Philip Piper, CEO of Swarm Fund. Brad Smith there for us live earlier this week at the Consensus Conference and that interview coming out of that. Uh, we are about 10 minutes away from the close of this markets here on this Thursday afternoon. Let's get a quick check of the big board there. We're still seeing mixed up there as well. We are seeing the Dow is down close to three tenths of a percent. Close to 70 points, uh, not at session lows right now, but approaching getting close to session lows. The S&P 500 is down just north of one tenth of one percent on the day, not at session lows there either. The Russ 2000 though, in record territory, it closed at a record yesterday, so any positive close on the day will be a record for those small cap stocks. Uh, this, the NASDAQ earlier in the day was down, it continues to be down at two tenths of a percent. Let's talk a little bit about what's, what's moving the markets though uh, on this day, Kristen. Coca-Cola is positive on the Dow for today, 1.7 percent, but Pulling the Dow down in negative territory right now, we're seeing Cisco down 3.8% and Walmart down 2.4%. We're going to talk Walmart in just a minute. We are. Those earnings that came out earlier this morning also, too, we should say Trump saying that these China trade talks may not be successful and that causing the Dow to do a bit of a reversal here as the session has gone on. Of course, we saw earlier in the day the market was actually positive there for a brief moment or so. Um, we got a lot of news to get to. PayPal, another stock that is certainly on the move. PayPal and Square, two stocks that are on the move in opposite directions this time. Now let's talk a little PayPal. Uh, the company reportedly nearing a deal to buy the European financial technology startup iZettle, AB, for around $2 billion. Now this move would put PayPal into hundreds of thousands of bricks and mortar retailers around the world. The acquisition could be announced as early as today. Now this would be, uh, this could set up a showdown between Square and PayPal. Square, of course, that company led by Jack Dorsey, it's built physical businesses, a physical business, I should say, with physical locations that PayPal had historically overlooked. Uh, this is a company, PayPal of course is trying to, PayPal has done an amazing job with changing the way that people pay each other and changing the way that people are paying stores. What they want to do though, is they want to bring that and do what Square has been doing, and right. this would allow them to do that. Right, so this is a six month chart, so you can see even though we know Square has been massively successful over the past even year, if we pull it back a longer chart here, but the, the point is that recently today, right, when this news did come out today, we see Square actually down two percentage points and PayPal holdings up more than 1% because of this news, because it is going to be, it would be the biggest acquisition ever for this company because it would give it a retail presence and too because it would give it an international, even more of an international presence, right, over there in Europe at a time where we know Square is really capitalizing on trying to double down on the U.S. market when it comes to some of these flea markets, um, you know, small businesses, you name it. It's so interesting because Square has built a business being able to help those small businesses, those food trucks, those uh, stands at flea markets, as you mentioned. Uh, increasingly, they want to get into larger businesses. I have seen it as larger businesses recently. That's what they're trying to do, though, is sign on those bigger businesses. Uh, this is PayPal's way of doing the same thing, essentially, in Europe. Yep. Okay, well, in some other news, YouTube is launching a new music streaming service. It is going to be available May 22nd next week and comes with features like personalized playlists based on your history. The free version will have ads, or you can pay $10 a month for ad-free streaming. YouTube is also rebranding YouTube Red as YouTube Premium, and that's going to cost 12 bucks a month. It will include the normal YouTube Red service as well as YouTube Music. Tim, it feels like, again, we mentioned this earlier, but they got to check this box, right? With the way that all these tech companies, what all these services that these tech companies are providing these you, days. You do, but I would argue that Google has been trying to check this box for about five years since uh, Spotify really changed the way that people consume music and changed the way that people actually buy music here in the U.S. when it came over from Sweden just a few years ago. Uh, Google has tried to do that, and Google was a little later to the game. They did come out with a product called Google Music All Access or Google Play Music All Access. I, 
it's hard to remember because the company has had many iterations of this. What the company has found though over the years, and this is so interesting, I shared this story earlier in the day today, uh, YouTube for many years, I don't know if it still is, for many years was the top place that people actually streamed music. Even if they were just listening to the music, uh -huh. they would go to YouTube on their mobile devices and they would listen to the song that they wanted to listen to. Uh, what Google found is they could find a way to monetize that through ads or by offering these premium subscription services. That happened with YouTube Red, that happened with YouTube Premium. Now the company's just trying to figure out where does the video part yeah. fall into this because right. for $9.99 a month, they want to compete against Spotify, against Tidal, against Apple Music, and they're uh, adding the video element for just a few more dollars a month. I think one thing that I guess I'm bullish on with this, Kristen, is the idea of discovery and what Google can do with discovery. That's, I think, is really what sets Spotify apart and from other it, services. Right, how it might be able to target you in ways right. that Spotify can exactly. because of the access to your email, your calendar, your photos, right? If you're using Google Photos, et cetera, I think that's a great point there. We haven't really seen the stock move much on this news, but I do think that, look, I don't necessarily know if it, it expects that it's going to compete head to head with the Spotify, right? In terms well, of that, the millions, more than 100 million paying subscribers that Spotify is targeting. I don't think I don't think it will, but I think that you would never subscribe to YouTube Premium and to Spotify. Right. The well, same you, way that you, you, you would with like a Hulu and exactly, a Netflix. Exactly. Exactly. You want to have a place where all of it can be, right? As, exactly. As these, as music and video sort of become one and the same. Yeah, I mean, I do, look, I do wonder what is Google going to be able to offer in this product that Spotify can't do better. I think the, what you said about data, it really makes a lot of sense, and maybe they can uh, surface music that it thinks will be interested in a lot better, because that's the way to win this game. We have a couple more minutes here uh, before the closing bell. Walmart is a company that we're following closely. At last check, it was down more than 2%, revealing that its online sales are growing. So the retail giant did report earnings before the bell. They announced that those sales grew 33%. Last quarter, the company has been changing its business model to attract younger shoppers online and compete with, well, you got it, Amazon. Walmart is also expanding its home grocery delivery and curbside pickup. Store sales and foot traffic is also up at Walmart's nearly 5,000 stores across the U.S. Walmart beat on the top line, Walmart beat on the bottom line. Uh, the stock down two, more than 2% right now. Analysts a little concerned over the miss in same-store sales growth. I don't want to give anyone the wrong impression. There was still growth for same-store sales. However, it wasn't as high as some analysts had hoped. That's right. So we did see store changes happening at Walmart and Macy's and that giving you know both of those uh, companies that is stronger than expected earnings reports. We did actually see that Macy's is now up for a second straight day after its strong report that we got yesterday, Wednesday, before the bell. But JCPenney is, you know, different. A lot of these retail earnings are starting to roll in. They are the last bit of earnings, the last sector that we get to report, of course, as earnings season usually spans, what, four or five weeks or so. JCPenney falling further behind. But at least the initial takeaway is Walmart is a company trying to buy its way to growth, right? That was the criticism of Salesforce or what people would say about Salesforce two years ago in terms of the acquisitions, more than a dozen acquisitions it made in the year in, in one single year. Walmart doing the same thing, it very open about the highly acquisitive nature that it's in, Flipkart being the most recent example. Flipkart certainly being the most recent example. We can't, of course, forget Jet.com, which the company bought just a few years ago for more than $3 billion. And that was the way that Walmart said, and analysts have said, Walmart can get into the homes of these younger consumers, those people who are living in cities like New York City and cities that younger people are moving to. This is where they're going to shop. This is how they're going to compete with Amazon. Okay, we got the bell. Ringing the closing bell at Tableau Software down here on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. We'll get you that podium photo here, the live video that is, the live stream. And over at the NASDAQ, Origin Bank Corp, ringing the closing bell over there. As we get ready to close the day. trade here, the closing bell, as we're showing you the markets have officially closed for trade. The Dow ending down 55 points, a loss of two-tenths of a percentage point. The S&P 500 down fractionally as well. The Russell 2000, Tim, as we see on the screen, a bright spot here today. Of course, we know markets will be lower after Trump made the comments that these uh, trade talks with China may not be successful, he said. Let's talk about some of those stocks that are moving the markets right now and move the markets today. CBS Corp down 4.1%. We talked about why that is a little earlier in the show. Over at the NASDAQ, Cisco dragging the index down. Cisco down 3.8% on the day. The Dow, we talked about Walmart 
Kristen down 1.9%. It was down more than 2% a little earlier in the day. All right, well, we have to say goodbye to our Twitter and Facebook friends. If you want to catch the second hour of Cheddar and the rest of our Cheddar Network, you can head on over to sling.com slash Cheddar or Amazon Live Video. Tim and I will see you on the other side of this break.